Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 58 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Got a great show for you today. We'll be speaking with martial arts business coach and brown belt in jiu-jitsu, Tom Kalos. But before we get to that, let's start with our martial arts quote. And the quote is from Bruce Lee. Empty your cup so that it may be filled Become devoid to gain totality. So I love that quote. Okay, moving on now, let's do a product review. I haven't done a product review in a while, so I thought it would be a good time to do one. So I want to tell you about a book that I recently read, and the book is called The Art of Learning, An Inner Journey to Optimal Performance. And the book is written by Josh Waitskin. And Josh spent his entire childhood cultivating the skill of and winning titles in chess. He was a a true prodigy, although he doesn't like that term, and spent many years winning multinational and international titles. He was the subject for the the movie entitled Searching for Bobby Fischer, which was based on a book written by his father. But he was a true phenom, and after many years in chess. He transitioned at uh, age 21. He transitioned to martial arts, uh, specifically Tai Chi Chuan and push hand competitions, uh, eventually winning multi-titles in push hands, including the world title, uh, as well as several other national and international titles as well. He eventually got into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well and has a black belt under Marcelo Garcia and co-owns Marcelo Garcia's Academy in New York City. Now, this book was written before his BJJ experience, but uh, it's an incredibly interesting book about his journey and about the principles he learned along the way that can be applied to any area of your life. I'd like to share a handful of quotes from the book. Okay, first one. The key to pursuing excellence is to embrace an organic, long-term learning process and not to live in a shell of static, safe mediocrity. Usually, growth comes at the expense of previous comfort or safety. And another one. A key component to high-level learning is cultivating a resilient awareness that is the older, conscious embodiment of a child's playful obliviousness. Next, the secret is that everything is always on the line. The more present we are at practice, the more present we will be in competition, in the boardroom, at the exam, the operating table, the big stage. If we have any hope of attaining excellence, let alone showing what we've got under pressure, we have to be prepared by a lifestyle of reinforcement. Presence must be like breathing. And another one. The human mind defines things in relation to one another. Without light, the notion of darkness would be unintelligible. And last one. The learning principle is to plunge into the detailed mystery of the micro in order to understand what makes the macro tick. Our obstacle is that we live in an attention deficit culture. We are bombarded with more and more information on television, radio, radio, 
cell phones, video games, the internet. The constant supply of stimulus has the potential to turn us into addicts, always hungering for something new and prefabricated to keep us entertained. When nothing exciting is going on, we might get bored, distracted, separated from the moment. So we look for new entertainment, surf channels, flip through magazines. If caught in these rhythms, we are like tiny current bound surface fish floating along a two dimensional world without any sense of the gorgeous abyss below. When these societal induced tendencies translate into the learning process, they have devastating effects. So again, really enjoy this book. Highly recommend you check it out. Very entertaining just listening to his journey, but the pearls of wisdom that he uh, throws down within it are, are well worth the read. Okay, on now to the interview. Today's interview is with Tom Kalos, and Tom is a veteran martial arts teacher, martial arts activist, and martial arts business coach. He's helped countless people grow successful businesses, and even more important, become better, more fulfilled people. Tom's a high-level black belt in Taekwondo under Ernie Reyes Jr., and a brown belt in BJJ under Elliot Kelly and Gustavo Enriquez. He's also BJ Penn's first BJJ coach and the father of Keenan Cornelius, world champion BJJ competitor. Tom also recently won gold in his division at the BJJ World. Tom's specialty is helping people think outside the box and come up with new, exciting ways, innovative ways to grow your school while making a difference in people's lives. He has a lot of very interesting endeavors going on, and he's going to share those with this interview. So I know you're going to find this very interesting. So without further ado, let's talk to Tom. Okay, I'm speaking with Tom Kalos. So, Tom, thank you so much for taking time to uh, talk with me today. I appreciate you being here. Oh, it's my honor. Thank you very much for inviting me to the show. Absolutely. So, I know you've got a lot going on, stay pretty busy, a lot of interesting things that uh, we're definitely going to talk about. But uh, to start it off, for those who aren't familiar with you and your background, just tell us a little bit about your history in martial arts. I know you could literally talk for hours just about this, but if you would just summarize kind of your history, how you got started, some of your milestones of your journey, and uh, how you got to where you are today. Well, I appreciate your asking. I first was exposed to martial arts in, I think it was 1964, when I saw the Green Hornet, and I saw nice. Kato on there, you know, and you know, all of a sudden, I was kicking around the house. I thought it was pretty cool. And, you know, I, prior to that, it had been Superman and Spider-Man, but uh, Kato became my hero. And then in 1969, I lived on a uh, decommissioned Air Force base, and there was a gym there on the way to the store where I would go buy my candy and stuff uh, because I was allowed to walk to the store. And I walked in one day, and there were a bunch of guys practicing judo on the mat. And I was fascinated. And uh, they, after class, the instructor invited me in and taught me some break falls. And then I religiously showed up, you know, <laughs> and they didn't right. teach kids, but these guys who were black belts already were, were happy to, you know, entertain me for a few minutes after each class. And uh, I found some books on judo and my friends and I started throwing each other and our little sisters and brothers on the mattresses and such. And uh, it wasn't much longer. Uh, 1971, my family moved in to town, which was Reno. And there was a Taekwondo school there. Uh, and they would practice out in the park, and my dad and I would drive by, and I, I knew where I wanted to go. So I went over and uh, joined. I was 11 years old at the time, and uh, so I'd had a little judo in my background, but not really a lot of formal instruction, and that was that began the journey. Nice, nice. I can completely relate about Cato. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you and uh, about a billion other people. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Nothing like it. The first time you've seen that. You never forget the first time you uh, you saw that. That was incredible. So at 11, you were introduced to uh, Taekwondo and um, started kind of formally training consistently. And, and uh, where did it go from there? Well, it, that was all I had, really. My parents were in struggling in their relationship. We had, I had six brothers and sisters, you know, and so there was that, you know, in a small house. So I 
I kind of lived outside of the house, away from everybody. And uh, the dojo that I went to had a string with a key on the end that you could reach in through the mailbox and open the dojo night or day, you know. And uh, wow. that's how it used to be back in the day, right? Nobody locked their doors. And so it gave right. me a place to go in the summers. It gave me a place to go when I was cutting school, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> right, right. I, I pretty much lived and I'd clean the dojo and, you know, and just try to, I was just enthralled with it. And then I, I practiced over the years and uh, a couple times I went to other schools or uh, one time I visited a school and was uh, booted out of the school I was in for visiting another school. You know, that's how it used to be. And so I trained with some other instructors, but I came back and eventually earned my first degree black belt at the age of 19. Uh, shortly thereafter, I was looking for a better environment. The one I was in, I was kind of the top dog and, uh, and the instructor wasn't really progressive, I felt. And so I went on uh, uh, to the, the online presence of the time. I went to the magazines, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I went to some tournaments and I, and I was introduced to Ernie Reyes uh, out of San Jose and his gang. And so I just picked up and threw everything I had on my motorcycle and had a friend down there and went and slept on his couch and started training under Ernie Reyes when I was 20. And uh, I've been with him ever since. Uh, I'm now a seventh degree black belt in uh, Taekwondo. And uh, about 22 years ago, uh, Mr. Reyes, we were getting ready to test for fourth or fifth on. I don't remember. And he lived right down the street from Health and Cesar Gracie's school in, in Mountain View. And uh, he started taking lessons. He was very progressive like that. And he turned yeah. to all his top guys. There were about 15 of us that were the highest ranks. And he said, okay, guys, you're all going to have to go study jujitsu. So we all fell all over ourselves and went to go find, you know, where <laughs> we could find it. And at the time, there was, uh, Half and Caesar were really the only instructors in Northern California and any guys that came to visit them from Brazil. So mm. I uh, had a friend, Dave Kovar in Sacramento, who had uh, Half and C or Caesar coming up once a week to teach from the Bay Area. And I, start, I, I uh, had just sold my schools and was living with a friend in Sacramento, deciding what I was going to do next. And I started those classes. I then relocated to Hawaii and, and started uh, – training with anybody there who was uh, knew anything about wrestling or jujitsu. And on the big Island where I moved, uh, this was 1993 or four. There was one, only one other guy who had Brazilian jujitsu experience. He was a blue belt. He was a cop on the, on a real remote part of the big Island. So he would drive in like an hour and a half to train with me once a week. And I thought he was a master, you know, looking back down, he, yeah. real, he was a neck cranker. Right. But, uh, right. So I started doing that and I would visit some judo clubs and I was wiping people out, even black belts in judo from just the little jujitsu that I knew. And I moved over to Hilo from the Kona side of the big Island. And the first day I got there, I threw up an ad it to, cause I wanted to train. I knew I had my tests coming up and that I was going to have to do, you know, jujitsu and, and look like I'd been training. And, uh, <laughs> BJ's dad, uh, uh, one of the kids, took the ad home from the local gym where I posted it looking for training partners. And he called me that day. And coincidentally, uh, I happened to recognize his voice and I just, I just plugged in my phone and the new place I was living in in Hilo. Well, it turned out BJ's dad was my landlord. Oh, and, really? Uh, so I recognized his voice and I started teaching BJ and Reagan and his other brother, JD, when he was around. And, uh, about a year into that, <clears throat> BJ was killing me. I mean, literally killing me. <laughs> and uh, every fight, every day was a fight for survival with, among him and his brothers and friends. And I took him, Mr. Reyes was having his 50th birthday party in uh, San Jose. And I, so I went to his dad, uh, BJ's dad, and said, hey, why don't you send him with me and I'll introduce him to somebody who's got a lot better jujitsu than I do. And, you know, uh, we'll see where it goes from there. And that's when I introduced him to health. And that's about a year and a half later, he was winning the, the world championships, the first non-Brazilian ever to win. And nobody even scored a point on it. Wow. At the tournament. Incredible. So, Incredible. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. And then in the interim, right after that testing, I had to have my hips replaced, uh, both of them. And I left mm. the big Island and moved back to my, uh, get back to California. I had both my hips replaced and then I kind of worked on recovery and took jujitsu wherever I was. And, uh, it's continued to this day. That was 22 years ago. I'm, I'm a brown belt. I, I uh, am not a great brown belt, but you know, I'm 57. I've, I've had three hip replacements now. <laughs> I'm jacked. Wow. I still show up on the mat, and I uh, yeah, 
I hope to earn my black belt someday. And a lot of good people have come and gone on my mats, like my my stepson Keenan is, and my son Shannon are both black belts under Atos, and and uh, Shannon earned his black belt under Charles Gracie, and I actually started that instructor as well uh, out of Reno. Uh, oh shoot, what's his name? He's going to kill me now. Uh, it'll come to me, but he runs Reno BJJ and and became a Gracie affiliate to Charles, and uh, he took his first jujitsu lessons with me as well. Nice, nice. Gary um, Great, Gary Great is his name. Gary, yeah, um, got to get that in there. Wonderful. Yeah, sorry, Gary. So go back for just a minute. Uh, you just covered a lot of ground, which is very interesting. You, you've obviously had a, a wonderful journey through the arts. When you first started over at House, uh, first of all, it says a lot about Mr. Reyes to to be so innovative and, and see the value of you know cross training and, and getting into other areas of martial arts. So you know, props to him for sure. Uh, what were your thoughts when you first? went over and started dabbling in jiu-jitsu over at house. Well, I remember, my, like? I remember my first lesson really well. You know, I'm, I was, I was a devoted, a devout martial arts practitioner. And I thought, you know, and I'd studied judo and I'd been around uh, American style jiu-jitsu. And so I, I wasn't a novice. So I joined the class of traditional warmups like old school did. And then we did drills like every school does now. And then we rolled and I, I rolled, Primarily with two or three guys. One of them, the main guy was uh, that I rolled with was uh, a white belt. He was maybe 10 years, 20 years younger than me. And he pretty much kicked my butt from A to Z. Every submission he knew, every position, I was just, uh, you know, like like I wasn't there. And afterwards, uh, I said, hey, thanks a lot. You know, I was digging it. And he, he said uh, – <laughs> I said, how long have you been studying? He said, about three months. And he said, how long have you been studying? And I said, oh, you know, a while. At that point, it had been like 25 years. <laughs> and uh, like myself, like so many people said, I'm never going to let that happen again. And so I really became committed to jujitsu because I didn't think mm -hmm. I should be, uh, as a longtime veteran martial artist and a veteran teacher, that I should be helpless in any situation. You know, it doesn't mean right. I'm going to win in every situation, but to let some guy with three months experience tear me to pieces of course i didn't punch yeah. him or poke his eyes or bite him but i wanted to <laughs> right i'm sure i'm sure but, it's a real uh, eye-opener oh but i you know that's the story that's told by so many martial artists who eventually turned to grappling arts realizing there was a huge hole in their game and for years we had debated you know well, what would happen you know there was even a well-publicized matches again men against women and style against style you know that had all these restrictive rules but we really hadn't faced the fact of what would happen until uh, the Gracies came along and really said, well, this is what will happen, you know, and exactly. And we all went, oh, OK, I guess. And the smart ones immediately started training and the ones who were a little thicker, it took them a little while longer. Right. That's so true. Heard that over and over and over. Yeah, we, so we owe a up. huge debt of gratitude to everybody in that lineage who stuck it out through the, the dry times when karate or taekwondo were king you know and they were kind of judo was on the back burner and and jujitsu but uh, some of those guys were persistent and they were disciplined and as a result they've changed the world absolutely it has truly started a revolution so going back to bj um it's very interesting how that all you know started uh with his dad being your landlord and everything it was very interesting so what was he and his brothers like the first time they came to train how was their attitude and what was that experience like well they were you know if you know hawaiian teens they're kind of respectful you know they call you uncle and they there's a hierarchy kind of korean japanese hawaiian where you know they're cocky and they're tough but they're they understand family and they, and it seemed like the kids there were somehow uh, nicer or more acclimated to uh, the classroom or the dojo than the kids I'd been teaching in the mainland. So there wasn't an attitude problem, although I could tell they were scrappers. They uh, they were respectful, and, and not all of BJ's brothers or friends showed up all the time, but BJ always showed up. And I was mm -hmm. training, you know, I knew how to train. I didn't know a lot of new jujitsu, but I knew that, Hey, if I know this technique, then I'm going to practice it over and over again until I understand it better. And that'll lead to other things. And I told BJ immediately and his friends and brothers, when they came in, listen, I'm not a 
jujitsu expert, but I know how to practice. So I know this much. Uh, we'll all learn some things. Maybe you guys will learn some things and we'll come here and this is where we'll practice. So I never pretended to be better than I was or to know something I didn't. I've been teaching long enough to know the error of that. And, uh, and we just kind of learned together and it wasn't very much longer that BJ figured out spider guard and, and, you know, there was no instruction out there at that time. There was no YouTube or any of that. So you kind of, it was catch as catch can. And, uh, we all helped each other and I just trained really hard. We just were drenched in sweat. We, we were all sore and tired. BJ told me years later that I ripped more t-shirts that he owned than, you know, <laughs> I was, I must've cost their family thousands because, you know, I'd had this technique where I'd grab the t-shirt and wrap it around his neck. You know, I, I was just fighting for my life, but, Oh, that's funny. But anyway, but you know, a the, good kid. The, there's a certain beauty in that though. What you described as, you know, today it's, it's really easy or let's say much easier for people who want to you know, start training. There's so many schools and you can literally walk down the street and find some and from day one, start having, you know, an organized fashion of training, but uh, back in the day, you know, you really, you really had to be hungry for learning. And a lot of times it was just your makeshift lab, you know, like you had. You, you had some knowledge. And, and basically, if you found someone with a little more knowledge than you, like, like he did, you, you sweated and you went through the, the motion and you kind of figured it out. And, you know, you, I admire you for saying you weren't an expert, but you did have a lot of things going for you. And the fact that um, you started the ripple that uh that was bj you know the, if it wasn't for you introducing him to it who knows what what he would have ever done if anything in that uh in his mma journey so great for you and then a lot of respect for you for saying at some point you know you probably need to go somewhere else to to get even further so i admire you a lot for doing that well th those are all sane things to do you know i mean but there are you know there was a uh, this thing about uh my Taekwondo background and, and how to teach and how to coach people about attitude. So I, early on, I sat those guys down and said, so here are the rules, you know, you, you show respect for each other about, you know, so I didn't have a formal jujitsu background, but I knew how to break a class down and how to, how to practice safely. And everybody bought into that. And, you know, there was a very formal way to teach jujitsu and it's still there, but it was different uh, 22 years ago but it was mm -hmm. very, uh, you know, any school you went to, they were doing the same kind of techniques because there were just a handful of guys who came over and everybody was learning from those guys and it spread, you know, quickly. But yeah, it's a different world now. And Keenan, for example, learned so much jujitsu online and spent so many hours studying uh, videos and such. You know, I, I used to get on him for spending too much time on the internet, but unbeknownst to me, besides playing video games, he was, you know, picking up all these techniques that he wouldn't have had on the classroom floor. I mean, you can, now with video, you can go find the best matches, the best people in the world and see mm -hmm. exactly what they're doing. And many of them break it down step by step. It's, it's a whole nother world because of YouTube. And by the way, I, I should mention that I tried to talk BJ out of fighting professionally because all my really? friends had grown up through the PKA and all these, you know, full contact karate groups and none of them really got paid much. And most of them had got ripped off at one time or another. So when he said, you know, I want to fight, I said, you know, you don't want to fight. I said, there's no money in it. I said, why don't you go to the Olympics? I know the Olympic team coach for judo. Uh, there's no money there either, but it's prestigious. But uh, right. fortunately he didn't listen to me and uh, you know, his <laughs> career is what it is, but that was a lucky place to be at the right time. Can you imagine that I was, there was only two of us on the big island, the entire big island, that knew anything about Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That's, that's amazing. It's amazing. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's really cool. It's a very cool thing, for sure. And, and talking about Keenan, so he started uh, with you. Uh, with, well, he got introduced read, with you or how? Yeah, I chewed Keenan out the other day because on his bio on his website, he says he started at 14 and with uh, Cassio Vernick. Well, give your dad some credit. Anyway, he started with me when he <laughs> right. was uh, when he was four. And he yeah. started learning jujitsu right away. We were doing uh, hip escapes and escape the mouse, escape the guard, how to do an arm bar. You know, everything that I knew, I passed on to the kids, sure. short of rear naked chokes and uh, and so on. Although Keenan didn't have the same uh, ability to filter out. So he taught his little sister, Eleni, how to do a rear naked choking in kindergarten. I had to go explain why she choked out a 
another kid <laughs> in the classroom, you know. But uh, oh wow, Keenan started training early on, but he didn't really get the bug until he joined. We went, moved back to California. He got into his freshman year at high school. He joined the wrestling team, and all of a sudden, in practice, he realized, oh my God. I've got all these skills and I'm kind of like a star here because he had all this jujitsu background. He was eating those kids up and then he took it seriously because I think it's where up to that point, he really didn't have anything that made him stand out from the crowd and his skills on the mat, uh, esteemed him. And I think that encouraged his behavior. So he started taking it seriously and not knowing really how to progress, uh, and, and being busy in my career. I, I took him down to, uh, Casio Vernix, and then I, I hired uh, uh, Marcos Terragrosa to come up from Sacramento to a little school that I had and teach us once or twice a week, and mm, nice. and uh, so it was Marcos and Casio Vernix that got Keenan uh, to the next level instruction wise, you know, and uh, but Keenan, uh, we had a Brazilian guy visit this dojo one time, my little dojo, and where my office was, I had enough space to put down mats, and he didn't speak really good English. But after he rolled with Keenan, and Keenan hadn't had very much instruction other than from me and a little bit from uh, Shiruto, and uh, he was still a novice, but the, guy, the kid comes to me afterwards and he says, Tom, and I said, what? He said, Keenan no jujitsu. He knows. You know? <laughs> nice. <laughs> and to Keenan's credit, his, his, I'm his stepfather. His father was, uh, had a mathematical mind. He was going to school to be an engineer. And I think Keenan inherited some of that. Mm. Uh, he just understood the mechanics of it in a way that I don't, I don't know if I ever will, but Keenan had it early on. Wow. That's really interesting. I didn't know that, but he definitely, uh, when he, when he got serious, he t totally took off I and mean, he's one of the best in the world for sure. It's oh, amazing. for sure. Yeah. It's amazing. And I assumed you uh, competed in Taekwondo, but have you done BJJ competitions as well, Tom? Well, I did. I competed in the United States, uh, mostly on the West Coast. I fought in Europe uh, in point tournaments, and uh, I, I fought Taekwondo style and was a Nevada State champion and fought in the Nationals and, and all that. But I wasn't good enough. I wanted to be on the Olympic team because we knew it was coming, but I just wasn't good enough, wasn't dedicated enough, and you have to have the right – coaching and the finances and then you have to be at the right place at the right time and win those matches without injury and it's a real gauntlet but i haven't competed much in jiu-jitsu although this last year uh just a few months ago in august i competed and took uh third in the worlds in my division there were oh, only four congratulations them, so. <laughs> well it wasn't that big a thing except that one year prior to the day of my competition i had uh spiral fractured my right femur and had to have a my hip replaced in it too because the hip broke out of the bone oh my gosh and so i i got the third hip replaced the second hip replacement on that side i had my bone repaired and wired together like like i have more wire in me than most radios and then uh and a year to the day after that surgery i was competing and so wow. you know, i was protective Phenomenal. of the leg I, I didn't fight super well but but I showed up and I competed and I took home a medal, so I was happy. That's great. I mean, that's great. I love. Uh, I'm older as well, and and I love to. Uh, I love when I can hear examples of people um, as they're aging, continuing to thrive and do well, even with your injuries. Um, you know, you're doing it. You're in the arena and you're and you're doing it. And uh, while, while so many people, you know, when they get a, past a certain age, are just kind of sitting on the couch and kind of cashed it in for all intents and purposes, but so much respect to you for, um, for still doing it and for competing at such a high level and, and, uh, doing so well. Awesome. Well, you know, uh, when I'm, when I'm gone, I don't think people will say, Oh, well, that guy was a technician extraordinary, but they will say that was one stubborn son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> that guy wasn't a quitter. <laughs> right, right, right. Very nice. Very nice. Well, Tom, let's let's change gears and talk about some of the uh, things you have going on. For the last, I don't know how many years, you've had a, a focus on helping martial artists build successful businesses. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your various things related to this. Uh, well, I guess we can start with the 100 method. Well, I I uh, started my consulting career started when I was a member of this billing company, and it was the first billing company really for the martial arts world and. Uh, they would collect your tuition for you and mail you a check each month. And so that all of us who were athletes, but not really, you know, uh, 
good at keeping uh, keep most of us didn't balance our checkbook that we it was a great way for them to help us and they skimmed 10 percent off the top and so uh, they taught and in that guy had helped grandmaster junri run his schools and so they had a lot of experience under their belt so i started adopting those methods and i became the second largest uh, contract holder for a period of time that they had in the united states because i was getting students and keeping them and I was keeping them through, I think, a high level of, of service. You know, it wasn't it wasn't what it is today, but it was at, at the time. You know, if you could get people and keep them, and that's pretty much still the the message of today. If you can get them and keep them, you end up having a school that's full of people. Well, I had a I had the second largest amount of agreements. I had a 90% collection rate, meaning that I uh, I had a 10% dropout rate. I collected 90% of all the contracts that were written and. And uh, in in lieu of that, I was invited to the board of directors of that company to help other instructors do what they did. And they printed a monthly uh, report of their, they had about a thousand clients at the time and they would print how much they collected from each one. So you could see the schools that were making the most money through their billing. And I happened to be at the top of that list in the top 10. And so it gave me some credibility. You know, people weren't were able to see the numbers and say, well, I want those numbers too. And they would start listening. And after I left that group and retired from teaching in my schools in Reno, uh, the internet was blossoming and it made it much easier to reach people or for people to reach me. And so I, I started helping people saying, well, this is what I did. This is what I didn't do. And, and, uh, and I've been doing it ever since. And I kind of run the green party of the martial arts community in that I, there's been a lot of, uh, kind of Dan Kennedy-ish, uh, scammy kind of health club dance studio tactics in the martial arts community because uh, there's so many people, you know, uh, there are opportunists who are teaching people to make a quick buck and to sell contracts. Mm-hmm. And so I, I kind of moved away from all that and said, you know, uh, we're going to be about substance and about ethics and about uh, uh, sustainable business practices that don't have you four months down the road, having cashed everybody out and all of a sudden you're desperate and you become a school that has to get new students as a matter of survival instead of focusing on keeping them. So I, I have continued that. And uh, it's the worst business to be in, in the martial arts community. It's the easiest one for anybody to get into. There's no hard costs. There's no uh, background check of experience, you know, and anybody who wants to put up a Facebook page and say they're a consultant can do it. And so, the waters are a little muddy, but I seem to survive and uh, am helping instructors in all styles uh, look at what they do on a daily basis, uh, bring quality and, and, and service to their groups, and to learn how to get students through uh, ethical, sound practices that aren't about hyperbole, but are about substance, and then how to keep and service those students so that they actually deliver on the promises they make to sell their lessons, you know, <laughs> cause we all, we're in a promise based industry where people, you know, you open a school down the street from me, you have a quarter of the experience, but you're going to make exactly the same promises that I make. But I, and the difference between uh, what we need, we're doing now, which is a promise based system is uh, an evidence based system. You have to develop the ability to provide evidence. For example, if you were an artist, a graphic designer, an architect or, or something like that, you wouldn't sell, your services based on the promises of what you could do, you'd show people your portfolio and say, this right. is the medium I work in and here's what I've accomplished. These are the kind of buildings I build. And based on that, they decide whether they were going to hire you or not. It's not like that in the martial arts. You don't, most uh, instructors don't have a body of evidence online. They just have uh, promises. And with the advent of uh, marketing gurus who say, listen, you don't have to worry about marketing. We'll do that for you. You just teach good classes. You have this kind of homogenous uh, formula sort of advertising where every website fits every school. And all it is is about getting people to click on and get a lead. And I mm-hmm. just don't think it's a sound way to teach. So I, my organization, which used to be called the 100, and I've transferred this year and put new lipstick on the pig. And it's, <laughs> called, uh, it's called the community because uh, initially the 100 was formed because I'd written Rosa Parks. And Rosa Parks had written me back a two page handwritten letter and it endeared me to her. And I, I liked her already, but after that I went, Oh man, you know, Rosa Parks wrote me. I love her even more. 
And then I was daydreaming one day and said, you know, I wonder if I'll ever be a Rosa Parks. You know, she was at the right place at the right time and took right action. And, you know, even though I want to make a difference in the world, I don't know, you know. And then I, right. I thought, well, I wonder if 100 martial arts teachers could collectively equal one 42-year-old diminutive African-American seamstress. You know, could 100 of us do what one Rosa Parks did if we saw the opportunity, applied ourselves to it? And that was the formulation of the 100, that mm. collectively we could do things none of us could do individually. But as times evolved, I, I'd had less people focusing on, you know, how can I make a difference in the world and more focus on how do I survive in my business and make enough money to compete with the Joneses, you know? So I've changed the name to the community to, to bring more focus on the fact that like in Buddhism, the Sangha is the community. The, the purpose of the community is to strengthen the practice of the individual and the community that I've formed is the purpose of it is to strengthen the practice of the individual because I realize that it's not knowledge that makes a school a successful. It's the, it's the practice of that knowledge. It's like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, jujitsu. I, I know a lot of jujitsu, but if you don't get out there and practice it, you become, you, you diminish its effectiveness and the value that it com- that comes from it. It's the practice that makes jujitsu powerful, not just the knowledge of it. That's powerful. That's powerful. It's the practice. It's the application. It also is the intent. Uh, with when yeah. you're looking at run, running a business, you know, you talked about uh, being ethical, and um, and the word integrity comes to mind. You know, with with your approach, because you know, just because you're a great martial artist doesn't mean you're a great instructor. But let's say you're both of those. That doesn't mean you know how to run a business. So a lot of times you turn to whatever's out there, and unfortunately. Throughout many of the years, it's been you know less than admirable uh, sources or or models uh, to work with or to turn to, and you come along with with all the integrity and in talking about making a difference on a truly remarkable level and and the intention. Um, it's great to be able to have knowledge to share, but that intention of of what you're really there to do and provide and the difference you're there to make, that, I believe that's very powerful, and I think that really sets you apart. Yeah, well, I mean, it's all it's like layers of the onion, you know. Uh, let's say that we have, and we do in Sacramento, we probably have uh, 20 good jujitsu programs, and some of the people are more uh, seasoned than others in competition or in time they've invested or their ability to get results, but pretty much everybody's on a technical playing field that's similar. You know, they're all good. So then what distinguishes people? And in, in the martial arts, just like in anything, you can only teach what you know, you you can't teach what you don't know. So my job as a teacher of teachers is to, to, to ask an instructor. So what do you know? And what are you producing? And, I tell this story, it's worth telling again, is that when I was first an instructor, I validated myself because I could kick everybody's behind in my circle of friends and in the community. So obviously I'm a good teacher. I can kick your butt, right? And then as I evolved and grew up a little bit, I I used my students as a measure. Well, look, my students are all winning, you know, national and local championships. I obviously am a good teacher. Look at my students. And then I grew up a little bit more and it was it was about the size of my school. Look, I've got 600 active students coming every week. Look at the size of my facility. Look at the car I drive. Look at our gross income. I mean, that's those are all indications that I'm doing a good job. And then I grew up a little more, and I realized at some point that all those things meant nothing in the quality of my instruction. What really mattered was how my students were taking what we practiced on the mat and applying it to other people, places, and things in the community. Until I got people to take what we were practicing and apply it in their lives to the benefit of other people, places, or things, I really wasn't a master teacher. When I got people to take the discipline and the respect and the consistency and the and the kindness and all those things you had to practice on the mat and start applying it with their brothers and sisters, with their wives, with their businesses in the community, now that was the highest measure. And I haven't come to uh, any other epiphany of what's beyond that. When you take your martial arts and it's making the world a better and more peaceful place, 
I, that's the highest level that I've come up with so far. But ask me in 10 years and I'll let you know if I've come up with something else. <laughs> it's an ever evolving process, right? Well, you think, you know, you know, when like I'm 57 this year. So when I was 47, I just knew I knew everything. And then of course you turn 49 <laughs> and you go, God, I was such an idiot, you know? <laughs> and so you kind of have to that's leave so the door true. open. So true. That's a great outlook, a great mindset for sure. And, you know, I was just talking on a segment on the last uh, episode where, you know, you can you can be very successful uh, and still not be fulfilled. And to me, the difference in those is service. Unless yeah. you're serving and making a difference through your service, you can have a great car, house, whatever, all these external uh, measures, but still not feel fulfilled. So I do believe that you're you're reaching people with that message for just to put you on the spot just a little bit. Uh, is there one business tip you can think of, a quick business tip for new school owners, if you just had to give them one quick thing to consider? Yeah, one of my favorite practices is the practice of communication. And uh, communication, marketing today is communication. It's not marketing like we've known before. And when I used to do marketing back in the day, I was spending $6,000 a month, which was 10% of my gross collected tuition. I was making 60000 a month in my school. I spent religiously 10% of that to promote and market. So I had a budget of $6,000 a month. I had a TV show on Fox that I paid for weekly. I did every form of marketing you can imagine except uh, billboards and skywriting, you know, everything else I'd done. And, uh, Today, and, and every time you paid for an ad, that ad went away when you stopped paying for it. It just went, you know, in the radio, TV, whatever. Today's marketing is evergreen, meaning that if I post a, a convincing and compelling video on YouTube with a good description and a title, it's going to stay there for as long as YouTube's in business. And it will keep promoting and keep being found because of the words in it. And so you build this body of evidence versus you know, this ethereal marketing that comes and goes as your budget allows. So today I try to get people to uh, market on a consistent basis to the tune of five to 10 acts of marketing every working day of the year. When you do five to 10 acts of marketing, the purpose of that marketing is to get one to three solid leads. That means somebody who's interested in what you do and thinks they might benefit from it or that you might meet their needs 20 working days a month. If you get three leads a day, people who say, yeah, how much do you, does it char- cost? You know, where do you, where's your school? I'm interested. That's in 20 working days, that's 60 leads. When you're on your game, you'll turn 60 leads into 30 students. If you sign up 30 students a month, month after month, or 15 or whatever number you can, and you retain a good portion of those, you end up filling the space you have. You have a finite amount of space and time. And when it's filled, The only other qualifier that it all works is that you did the math right, that the money you charge your students actually pays to run your machine because you can fill up a school and find that you're still really short on the ability to hire or put away uh, money for investments or to save money. And that often means that you didn't think it out from the beginning. And the martial arts isn't like running a school isn't like another business where you come To me, uh, you know, I have some money and you say, you know, this town doesn't have a laundry. And I think if we put in a laundry, we could make some money. And I'd say, well, let's put together the numbers and do some projections. And we would do that. And I'd say, well, I don't see where this is a better return than just putting my money in the bank and getting simple interest. I don't want to invest in this. Or we'd look at it and say, yeah, yeah, that looks realistic. Let's let's half those numbers. And we still make money. Okay, I'll invest in this. It seems like a worthwhile risk. Martial arts school owners don't do that. We go out and start a class somewhere because we need sparring partners, and we uh, we kind of grow it because it's our passion, but it's not well thought out often. And that that puts a lot of instructors in a place where they're operating from desperation instead of inspiration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. So thus the thus the Lloyd Irvins and the and other guys who run these kind of. Uh, heavy sales pressure things because a lot of these guys have come to the place where, Hey, I don't want to quit doing this. I, this is what I love, but I'm desperate. And so they take desperate measures and try to, you know, it's like the 49ers coming to California very few of them struck gold, but uh, there was a, you know, everybody had the dream that they might get rich right. if they just did this one thing. So I, 
I try to get the instructors to, to look at what they do on a daily basis. If you want to be good at jujitsu, you better be showing up at that dojo. You better be mm-hmm. on the mat and you better do it consistently because you can have the dream to be good, but unless that's followed up by action. And it's, if you break it down into little daily things, uh, you know, a, a, like, for example, when I ran this program called the Ultimate Black Belt Test, we did 125, 150 push-ups a day. Well, in a year's time, that's 50,000 push-ups. And 50,000 is an overwhelming number, but 120, your grandma can do it if she breaks them into a set of 10, you know? <laughs> and right. so that's the same thing with marketing. You break it down on a daily basis. Most school owners I know are trying to communicate the benefits of what they do to their community through psychic powers. They're not saying it. They're not showing it. They're not developing a body of evidence. They're not talking about it, writing about it, or anything. Yet they expect their community to value what they do when nobody's telling them what it's worth and or showing them how it makes a difference. Mm. And uh, there's this kind of a formulaic buzzword, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, honor. Well, yeah, that's easy for anybody to say. Now show me the money. Show me where right. it's actually making a difference. Ironically, today, it's easier than ever before to tell good stories and to, to use your phone to, to communicate in the only four ways there are to communicate to your community. That is the spoken word, the written word, images and modified images, and video. Everything revolves around those four concepts. And so you, every, school instru- every instructor, every school owner is his or her own media company. And they have one client, that's them. And you use the media, you use video and the written word and the spoken word, be it face-to-face or in podcasts or whatever, to communicate the benefits. And the difference between old school marketing and marketing today is that the old marketing didn't benefit my students and it didn't really benefit from me me that much because I learned to get a, a message that was a call to action in a very small space. And so the the image was really important. The text was really important. The call to action was really important because I only could afford a four by six ad or 30 seconds on the radio or TV. Now right. you haven't, you can, you can have 10 minute video shows. You can write endlessly and it's stored there. And so in the largest phone book in the world, the internet, right? So uh, you have to learn to communicate what you do. And as I practice doing five to 10 acts of marketing every day, I polish my game and I learn to develop my vocabulary and I learn to look deeply at what I'm doing and what its value is. And I look for uh, evidence that backs what I'm saying. And I curate other people's content to validate what I'm doing and to connect me to good ideas. And the person who lays down, say, three pieces of media in a year's time has done a thousand pieces of evergreen media. And if you've practiced communicating what the value is of your work a thousand times, you're going to be better than the person who hasn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to think I was marketing, you know, writing all these posts and doing all this stuff. I like I have over a thousand videos on YouTube uh, because I was marketing my business. But as I looked back, I went, wow, I've developed skills and a vocabulary that I wouldn't have otherwise. And so marketing today benefits the instructor because An instructor that cannot articulate to his or her students the value of what they're doing leaves it to chance that the that the student's going to come across it by accident or from someone else. And I don't I don't think a master teacher today uh, can leave that huge gap uh, between the physical and the mental unspoken. I think they need to go out there and teach people about what this is about. And you know, and our our work has to evolve. For example. And forgive me for going on for so long. You're talking about my favorite subjects. <laughs> the, uh, the top 10 killers of men, women, and children in the world, much less the United States, in the world, don't have kicking, punching, and choking on the list. The things that are actually causing the most suffering and the most death and the most pain are not things that self-defense teachers are teaching on the classroom floor, with some exceptions, like Hori and Gracie is, and the Gracie family is really – embraced diet and nutrition, which is very rare in most martial arts schools. It's kind of catch as catch can. And that's because they know about that and you teach what you know. And so they're out dealing about with self-defense from a dietary perspective, which is at the root is the cause of most of our suffering in Mm -hmm. the world today or diet related 
you know, diabetes, right. one in three children affected by diabetes in the next decade, they predict. But if you're teaching martial arts and you claim to teach self-defense and you teach kids how to block punches or to keep from being mounted, but you're not talking to them about food, well, you've just taken self-defense and made it a very, very small uh, specialized piece of the pie instead of taking a holistic approach. So that's part of my work is to get instructors to think about literacy and anger management and meditation and food and food production, not just food itself. Where does that food come from and how is it produced and what's the consequences of it and the environment mm -hmm. and other things that are, you know, uh, in the periphery of self-defense. But, you know, we we're in an industry that if you go for instructor training, you either learn physical technique or you learn sales closes, you know, like you go to right. yoga training. I had a friend who went to a yoga class. He, they were dissecting cadavers. You go to an instructor training for martial arts teachers and they're learning how to do the Ben Franklin close. <laughs> so we have a system that's driven sure. by some opportunists who are, you know, trying to sell equipment or trying to sell billing and they really don't have much vision. And uh, so that's a gap I'm trying to fill. That's really great because I, I, I couldn't agree more that we have to expand our our focus and our scope. We truly want to to make that true difference to people. And we can teach techniques, but if we're not empowering them to live better lives, healthier lives, more impactful lives, well, we really haven't done what we could have. Well, you, spoke, you know, a lot you, of that – oh, go ahead. You mentioned the ultimate black belt test. I, I, just for time, I want to make sure we get uh, a few more of these – um, topics in, and you mentioned the uh, ultimate black belt test. So could you elaborate a little bit on that? The first time I think I ever heard your name uh, was in conjunction with reading something about the ultimate black, black belt test. And it was very intriguing. So if you would share a little bit about how that started and what that consists of. Well, the ultimate black belt test is a project. Uh, I love projects because they have a, they often have a beginning, a middle and an end. You know, you, you start a painting and, you know, when the painting's done, it's done, and you get to move on to something else. It's not like a lifetime endeavor. So the ultimate black belt test was the answer to a problem that I saw in the martial arts community in that black belt tests were either grossly inadequate or they were a hazing, you know, that were was potentially injurious or, you know, like I had to have my hips replaced because I, I didn't know what proper training was. I overtrained and wore my body out. We didn't know any better. And a lot of black belt tests, you know, uh, were either uh, to keep people from getting their black belt or they were, you know, they were somewhere in between. And I thought, you know, what if we rethought the whole process? I mean, what's the smartest way to go for it? And I realized that it wasn't getting everybody to, to do the same thing. It was looking at the individual and saying, what do you need? You know, like a great black belt test isn't testing you on what you're good at alone. You, you are more revealed and become more transparent as far as what your strengths and weaknesses are by looking at what you're not good at, you know? And, and I thought, you know, and I put on a lot of black belt tests, you know, hundreds and hundreds with Ernie Reyes's group. We had 600 black belts graduating a year. And, uh, I, I knew how to haze people. I mean, I could put you through a torturous test in a weekend, but you know, it, I used to, when I was in college, I used to, to cram for classes and I could retain the information, take the test and then have like a 10% retention rate afterwards. And I thought, right. are we really doing our best work? What's harder to be consistent and to do, let's say 150 pushups a day or come to the test and try to do a thousand, you know, it's better to get people to focus on uh, long-term consistent behavioral changes if we want to. So, you know, so instead of torturing everybody for a weekend, I ran a test that was a year long. And if you had a year to do it, like, for example, 10 minutes a day in a year is 60 hours. So if I could get people to, to read or to meditate or to do 10 minutes worth of push-ups or anything a little bit every day, if I had a year to do that, I could not only get them to do more than they could have in a weekend or a week or even a month, but I could also embrace subjects that were more indicative of what we thought and said the martial arts was about. Uh, for example, before I started the test, I asked my friends, I said, you know, how many of you have seen black belt tests or how many of you know, know black belts who if the public saw what they did to get that black belt test, they would laugh, right? Like, 
you know, they, it, it discredited us. Oh, I thought you guys learned this, and I thought you had to do this to be a black belt. Well, no, the truth is I just had to stick around long enough and fight a bunch of guys and break some stuff, and I got my black belt, and I paid the fee. And uh, so I said, let's make a, a year-long testing process. Let's make it transparent. Let's journal everything we do, because when you're being watched, you're gonna ch- it's going to change your behavior. And let's, let's put online examples of tests that people go, just get blown away by like you have time to take a ride around with police in the car. You have time to, to go to take that rape self-defense course or to volunteer a domestic abuse counseling, uh, a hotline or to uh, read the 10 books that you've wanted to read or to write a book or to do all sorts of things. So the ultimate black belt test was a redesign and an experiment among my friends and some of my students I said, let's try this and see what happens. So we did, the first curriculum was 50,000 push-ups, 50,000 sit-ups, 1,000 rounds of sparring, 1,000 repetitions of an individual kata, 1,000 acts of documented kindness uh, where you wrote down what you did. And by the way, I had a lot of the guys come and say, you know, I don't want to do that because uh, who wants to say, hey, I'm kind, I'm kind. <laughs> you know, it's kind of <laughs> like, and I said, I understand that. I can totally appreciate it. But when you're a teacher, you do things for your students that you would never do for yourself. And you're doing those thousand acts of recorded kindness to show kids just how mm-hmm. damned easy it is, you know, <laughs> and that there right. are all these different ways you can do it because you have to lead by example. And then we did, uh, you had to mend three relationships gone bad. You had to right three wrongs you've done in your life. You had to interview or profile uh, 10 living heroes, people who were living, who you considered to be heroes. And that came out of one of the guys who was testing was a prominent school owner, had about 400 members. And when he sent me his list, because I made everybody send me their goals, you know, it was how big his biceps were going to be and what size his waist was and what kind of car he was (laughs) going to drive, his income. And I said, you know, these are all decent goals, but there's something missing. And what I realized after looking deeply at it was that this guy wasn't hanging out with people who asked more of him. Mm. You know, if you so I, I, I added the curriculum uh, component that you had to profile and uh, 10 living heroes and they had to be living because you had a chance of meeting them or right. talking to them. And so, for example, one of the testers who was a musician, uh, he, evidently he was an, a Grammy award winning uh, country songwriter and I didn't know it, but cause I don't listen to that junk, but uh, <laughs> he wrote, uh, he wrote uh, Maya Angelou and son of a gun, if my Angelou's office didn't call him and say, my Angelou wants to meet you. He went, ended up going with his daughter and living with her for a week and co-writing songs with Maya Angelou as a result wow. of this 10 living heroes thing, you know, and that happened again and again, those kind of things. And so it, it was really interesting to see how it turned out and how people used it and uh, what became of it. And, and uh, I like that kind of journey. It, it's, it's if you've ever read Joseph Campbell, the hero of a thousand mm-hmm. a thousand faces. Yes, I have. It, this is all about the hero's journey, which is which he defined as the exodus, the epiphany, and the return. You leave out on your journey, you learn something, and have a discovery along the way, and you come back and tell your story. And uh, I thought we'd have better black belt tests as a as a community, the martial arts community, if we saw better examples of how people were using their tests for personal and community family, social transformation, because we didn't, most tests I knew were done in private, especially high ranking ones. You know, nobody was invited. It was a small panel of people. And, right. you know, I thought, well, let's see, let's open up and show what instructors do. And, and what that did is it made us all turn and go, well, we better be doing something powerful <laughs> because if we're just going to show them that I'm here, exactly. you know, clicking the, clicking the TV thing, you know, four hours a night, you know, and not really doing anything that, gives credit to our industry, uh, I'm not going to look good. So it caused everybody to say, well, what am I doing and how can I improve it? So recording meals and doing meditation and uh, fixing challenges and doing community projects. And it, it, it uh, esteemed what we were doing in a way that wasn't happening before that. Now it's gotta be one of the coolest things uh, I've ever heard of. Um, related to martial arts and, and black belt testing. It's true, true, um, I mean, truly meant to elevate people and to have them grow higher and higher and make a true difference. 
Well, I'm now kind of moving into, you know, the ultimate black belt test. I never made a patch. I never made a uniform. I never made a T-shirt. Uh, I didn't make anything that uh, branded it. I didn't trademark the name, although I, uh, some people who used it, I asked them if they'd either give credit or find another name for it. But I, I felt like it was like a mandala thing, you know, where you take all this time to build this beautiful thing and then you, they blow it away to, as a, as a symbolic of, uh, of what's the right word, uh, impermanence. And so Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I, I don't mind that the ultimate black belt test goes away, that, that it was a project that I did to say, Hey, we can do a lot better. And I think, the ideas, which the original website was uh, got a million hits plus on it, and it got a lot of national publicity. I think that brought a certain thought transformation, you know, like mm-hmm. a change making thought transformation to many schools. And now schools that embrace acts of kindness or embrace other concepts or have longer, more transparent testing where the students log in and, and journal their progress are a lot more common. And I so I think it's probably my greatest contribution to the martial arts community mm-hmm. is the is we don't have to do black belt tests like we do them because there's really no precedent for how they're done. It's a very sure. it's an it's not a, an old process. It just started with Kano, as far as I know. But we can do a lot better, and we can do it in a way that, for example, if you have ten students testing, whether it's this year or next year, and each one of them profiles their journey online. Not only do they keep this wonderful documentation of their journey, which I have like one picture of me as a teenager doing martial arts. You know, it's like a treasure. And uh, imagine if your grandfather or great grandfather journaled any part of their life extensively with video and writing and images for any period of time. When they're gone, that's like, oh, my God. Or any master teacher who today, like Bruce Lee did, kept uh, journals and really wrote what they were thinking and, and, and where they were at all those things are treasures. Now, well, you're doing that for your students. If they journal about their journey, you're you as the master teacher saying this period of time is more important than you'll ever know. You can't know how important this is now, but you will someday you'll look back and go, Oh my God, well, you'll have something that nobody had me doing when I was doing it, but you'll treasure these things and the people you train with and the experiences you have will be little golden treasures for you. And at the same time, if they're journaling publicly and they're doing really good work, that doesn't hurt a school at all. For sure. That's actually sure. the most authentic kind of school marketing to say, hey, here's how I'm using what I'm learning. And it's about community. It's about family. It's about my diet. It's about health. It's about helping others. Early on in the ultimate black belt test, I told the guys, I said, you know, the real measure of whether your uh, test is authentic or not would probably be going to your spouse you know (laughs) Mm -hmm. i know what this guy's doing you know publicly but is he really you know and if the spouse gave him a thumbs up you know and i have this concept that the 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 highest measure of your test which you can you can see this happening with guys like hickson and hoist and and all our martial arts heroes is not what you accomplish but on how your journey affects people in your circle of your sphere of influence. Yeah. Hickson's is vast, you know, Orion's is vast. Mine is much smaller, but you measure like you measure a black hole. You can't see the, the hole, but you can see how it affects everything around it. And I think that would be the ultimate black belt test where, you know, your test is measured. It's success is measured by how it's impacted your family, your friends, your students, and your community, if not the world. I completely agree. So just quickly, we have a, a little bit more time left. I want you to uh, speak to the work you've done building houses and also uh, talk just a little bit about your, your artwork and your portraits. Well, for the last 15 years, I've been running a project called the Alabama Build Vention, and uh, that is a project where martial artists come from all over the world, and we spend four days building or renovating structures in a, this very small community in in the black belt of the united states the poorest region uh, in alabama uh, in hale county where for example uh in the in the 40s uh 
James Agee and Walker Evans, Walker Evans being a photographer, James Agee, collaborated on a project called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. It was about four very poor itinerant farm families that were struggling to survive in that area. And it's pretty much still the same in many ways. And uh, we go there and we volunteer, you know, sometimes with an avant-garde architectural program and sometimes with a, a woman who was an intern at that program who's since started a nonprofit. And she's pretty much my liaison there. And it brings – part of my profile as an instructor is I get instructors to embrace projects, uh, projects being, uh, hey, if you want to be a painter, then paint something. And if you want to be a leader, let's, let's practice something that requires you to be a leader. That If you're going to promote the benefits of your work, do something that promotes the benefits of your work. Show me the work. This is a project, and this concept is called project-based leadership training. Uh, in the martial arts community for a while, there was this big push to, to, to sell leadership. And basically, it was just another way to mark up a program and get kids to enroll for some uh, new rate structure. But they didn't really have any curriculum. Uh, they knew, and most instructors knew, that there was some kind of leadership training going on in the periphery just by learning to teach classes and such. But they didn't really – it was really just a way to get uh, them from $100 a month to 120 And so I said, you know, I, I recognize, but let's, let's authentically teach leadership. And if you're going to teach leadership like you teach martial arts, you have to do it. You can't talk about it. You can't think about it only. You have to actually go out and do things that require you to be a leader. And so – I started show I said, you know, the let's get in let's get our students to do small projects in the community where they have to apply what they learn on the mat and they can be in a size and scope that's suitable for the person who's doing it. A 6-year-old won't do what a a 36-year-old accountant can do, but you know, they they've got some ability to go out there and take the work out of the dojo and put it to work in the world. And let's let's use our media company to profile these projects and show our community how People are taking our work and putting it to work. You know, this is very congruent with my theme. So I ran the Alabama project and run that to actually show everybody how I do a project because uh, my projects are grander in scope. I have more resources and more friends and more help and uh, more chutzpah, you know, and uh, so my projects are on a grand scale. But everybody who comes to that project's go project goes back to their own community and says, I get it. I've been in a project like that. I can do something like that. I can do it on a smaller scale. I can do it in my own community, but I, they, I see how he worked the media and how he worked the community and how he got the work done and how he organized the group. And I can do that too. And I wanted to see more schools going out in their communities and marketing themselves, not through formulaic advertising, but through actual, you know, feet on the ground, make a difference. I, I was working with John Ree on a project one time and Grandmaster Ree said, I said to him, Grandmaster, can we get Chuck Norris to, help us with this. And he said, sure, but we'll have to ask him when he can't say no. And he said, by the way, Tom, if you ever want somebody to do something for you, uh, you got to get them in a position where they can't say no. And then they'll say yes. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think that a martial arts school, if it wants its community to truly respect it, they have to, it, it has to go out and impact people in that community until they get chicken skin, until they get tears coming out of the side of their eye, because we have that mm. potential. But, yeah. you know, you, you have to go out and do it. So that's what the Alabama Project is. We, in, over the last 15 years, we've raised far more than a quarter of a million dollars. We've been responsible wow. for 40,000 man hours of time. We've had Maya Angelou involved, Julia Butterfly Hill came, Keisha Thomas, uh, just all sorts of activists. And I love having people who come and talking about subjects that are a huge juxtaposition of subjects you might find at any other martial arts event. So we have diabetes activists come, environmental activists, social activists. Uh, this next year, uh, if I decide to run the program, <laughs> I'm on the fence every year. Uh, I'm going to be inviting a uh, writer and uh, a land grant activist who is responsible for helping people keep small organic rural farms from being swallowed up by big agri-commerce. And just, just getting instructors to think outside of their the standard uh, dominant paradigm of, of the martial arts community because we we have the potential to to make such a bigger impact that would not only benefit our community but directly comes back as a benefit to us because people start to see us not as another Popeye's chicken franchise that does everything you know by the book but that that actually you know is has a value 
far beyond what people recognize. And I think that, by the way, I think the martial arts school in the future is, again, it's taught by people who know things like uh, my friend Adiso Bonjoko, who teaches uh, hip hop, chess, competitive chess playing and jujitsu. Uh, Trumpet Dan in uh, Southern California, who's a trumpet player who bought a bunch of trumpets on eBay and his students learn jujitsu and chess and music in his school. Right. And I, I love to see a school that was about design build, you know, where over here you had a big dojo and over here you had a big workshop and you taught kids to frame walls and to, to build structures and to repair things. And I have a friend named Emily Tillerton, who you can see on a, a beautiful TED talk that has millions of views. She uh, runs a design build program for girls called, uh, and it's a summer camp that says, I can build anything. And, or I can fix anything. And she teaches g- girls ages fifth through eighth grade how to do well, use welders and lathes and band saws and, and uh, really empowers girls. Well, uh-huh. she also has been uh, hinting at doing a martial arts program. You know, I th- I, I'd like to have a school like that where the kids do an hour and a half here and they come over and do an hour of this. And, and we blur the lines between what is martial arts and what isn't. Mm, that's really cool. Very cool. Uh, last thing, uh, share with us a little bit about your artwork and portraits you've been doing. Well, I've uh, always had the heart of an artist, but I wasn't putting it into practice. And when I broke my leg <laughs> last year, I had to sit around and I was going to go nuts. So I, <laughs> right. I picked up my old carving tools and I started uh, practicing the art of uh, wood block carving and linoleum, uh, where you can carve something out and the white space you carve out doesn't get ink when you roll ink over the top and you only see the, the, the sides that parts that you didn't carve. And so I, this recently I started doing portraits because I wanted to do something for a friend and I did a portrait for him and uh, I thought, Oh, you know, this is kind of fun. And so it's really a meditation for me. I mean, I don't think about work. I don't think about training. I just focus deeply on what I'm doing and you have to look with an artist's eye to when you're carving just white and black because uh, you have to decide what, what works and what, uh, yeah, it's just interesting. And then it's a way for me to spend time with these people that I love. Uh, Elio Gracie and, and uh, uh, Kano and these guys. And I, I've noticed that as I carve them out, it's almost like spending time with them. I have to look really carefully at their faces and in their eyes and, and at the face, their, their face. And it, it's, it's very rewarding for me. And it gives me a chance to do what marketing is today. And what marketing is today is that when you promote your work, uh, there's a, I learned it from uh, Chris Brogan. He said, you know, when you do media posts, uh, 11 should be about other people, places, and things. And every 12 can be a blatant self-promotion. And when I'm talking and showing respect to Keiki Fukuda the, or uh, – Carlos Machado or, or uh, Oyama or any of these people that I either am doing or are going to do portraits on, it's really talking about myself because I value these people and their contribution to the world. And so portraiture has become a way for me to help my friends, to bring more credit to them, and for me to spend some time with them and show the respect that I feel for their their life's work. And so and then I, you know, some people have been asking me for them. And so I had to get the Gracie's permission and the Kiki Fukuda Foundation's permission and uh, Joe Lewis Foundation. And so now I'm out reaching out. And when I show interest in their work and offer to contribute or pay or donate prints, uh, I make friends and friends help friends. And so it's, it's marketing Absolutely. again, you know, but it wasn't my intent to do that. But when you engage in things in your school that engage other people, where you give credit to other people and you mm-hmm. show what you care about, you're really talking about your own school. And it's a great way to do promotion. And that's what I'm teaching other instructors, not to be artists necessarily by carving or painting, but how to be artists in choosing careful, carefully their projects, how they spend their time, what they, how they make their impact uh, get out of their dojo and and manifest itself in behaviors and in actions within their community. And when the community sees and is impacted by your work, they're much more likely to come in with a level of respect that you'll appreciate when they enroll. 
versus I, I came in because you're the cheapest school in town, you know? <laughs> exactly. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. Uh, if somebody wants to learn more about your artwork or your other endeavors, uh, the, the house building or your uh, your coaching, how's the best way to uh, to reach out to you and, and contact you, Tom? My website is TomCallis.com, and you can find me there. And uh, I'm on, you know, all the popular social media platforms. It's hard to search my name on the web without finding my phone number because I give it out freely. Uh, I I remember that there was a guru talking about uh, – disconnecting and making yourself hard to reach and uh, that it, somehow it raised your value. But I, I subscribe to the opposite of that. I make myself very easy to reach. I'm not too big or too well-known or too high of a rank to be of help to people because everybody that, that I really care about has made an extra effort to help me along the way. Jun Ri, Ernie Reyes, uh, Carlos Valencia, Dave Kovar, all these Hicks and Gracie, all these people who I respect and admire are easy to reach and willing to help. And I try to pass that along too. I, I met Richard Nixon one time and he told a story that uh, he met, he saw Babe Ruth in a restaurant when he was a young Senator. And during the entire meal that he ate, uh, people kept coming up to Ruth and no matter how many people interrupted him, mid com whatever, and asked him to sign, he was so gracious to them. And uh, Nixon told his wife, Pat, he said, if I'm ever famous, I'm going to behave just like that. And he did. He would find anything for anybody and was always very gracious. And, and I love that. I think that's, that's important. And so I make myself available uh, easily. So please reach my website and thank you for asking. Yes. Yes. And I just want to say, I can't say enough about uh, the respect I have for you and the impact that you've made in people's lives. Uh, you truly are uh, a man of integrity and a man of action. So uh, Thank well, you very I, much I, for your time. It's been my honor. Thank you for t taking the time to let me bend your ear. And for those of you listening, thank you. It's been, it's my honor, and I, I feel like I've only just begun. All right. Well, I wish you nothing but uh, a long, healthy, and happy life, my friend. Thank you, my friend. And everybody, keep your feet on the mat, and uh, I hope to meet you sometime in the future. Thank you, sir. Okay. Really enjoyed that interview. Very fascinating and interesting person is Tom Callos. Stay tuned now for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Okay, time now for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Let's start with a quote. The shell must break before the bird can fly. And that's from Alfred Lord Tennyson. So let's think about this notion for a moment. What's your shell? What limitation have you placed on yourself? What's one thing in your life that you'd like to do or accomplish that you've held yourself back from? What's your shell? What are you willing to do to break through the shell in order to fly, to soar? Decide right now to take at least one action today to accomplish a goal you have. And as you go through your day, your week, your month, think about this notion of breaking through your shell so you can fly. In doing so, I think it will serve you very well. Now, go break through your shell. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. I appreciate all feedback, so if you have feedback, please don't hesitate to give it. If you have ideas for the show or for guests, please let me know about those. You can leave feedback on the website at www.gracyjujitsurocks.com. You can also leave feedback on iTunes, and while you're there, make sure to rate the show. It helps us with our standing in iTunes. If you haven't liked us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, please go ahead and do that. And don't forget to share the episodes on your Facebook and social media. Again, thanks again for listening. And until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat. <laughs>